I'm Lynn Platt. I'm a State Department fellow on detail this year to the Wilson Center's Canada Institute. And um, I want to begin by thanking all of you here today for not hitting the snooze button this morning. Um, it's really, really nice uh, that we have uh, such a great crowd and um, because we have uh, an incredible program of uh, very fine speakers who've agreed to, uh, to come and help us out with the consideration of the issues that we're going to be uh, uh, discussing today. Um, you can't fill a room like this on a Monday morning uh, without a lot of help. And so I'm going to be saying thank you a lot over the course of the day uh, to my Canada Institute colleagues and to our director, Laura Dawson, who couldn't be with us but is going to be tuning in via webcast. Um, and we'll be thanking our sponsors who are listed on the program and our partner organizations, the Vancouver International Airport, InterVistas, and the Public Policy Forum uh, of Ottawa for making making this truly uh, bi-national Canada-US effort to examine public policies on transportation and innovation across our 8,000 kilometer, 550,000 mile northern border. And I'm going to begin the formal program with a welcome from the Wilson Center leadership uh, represented by Robert Litvak. Uh, Dr. Litvak, he hates to be called that by the way. <laughs> Uh, is the Director of uh, International Security Studies here and Wilson Center's Senior Vice President. Um, he's written uh, books on Iran and North Korea and uh, nuclear uh, nonproliferation. He earned a doctorate in international relations from the London School of Economics um, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations a consultant to Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, was National Security Council staff director for nonproliferation in the first Clinton administration. Um, he's also uh, been an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Foreign Service School and has held visiting fellowships at Harvard, at Oxford, uh, at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, pretty impressive on the whole. Uh, he's available later if you want to talk to him about the scary stuff going on uh, in the world. Uh, but for now, we're just happy that he is here to start us off. Rob. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Yes, I am a believer in the don't call yourself a doctor unless you can write a prescription. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, here at the Wilson Center, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Over the years, we've built a reputation based on the work done by our 11 regional institutes. Uh, in fact, uh, for station identification, this year, the University of Pennsylvania's Global Think Tank Index named the Wilson Center the number five think tank in the United States and the number one uh, regional studies think tank in the world. Uh, the Canada Institute, uh, directed so ably by Laura Dawson, is a prime example uh, of that excellence. Uh, Laura has drawn in some Canada-related expertise to strengthen her program, from advisory uh, board members like retired Ambassador Paul Fraser to current global fellows like Alan Burson and Catherine Friedman, uh, to a couple of former U.S. Consul Generals who served at uh, large posts in Canada. Lynn Platt, uh, our current North American Competitiveness Fellow, and a shout out to her for superbly organizing today's event, along with her colleagues in the, in the Canada Institute, and Jim Dickmeyer, also a Canada Institute Global Fellow. This event today is the result of the Canada Institute partnering with two other excellent organizations, the Vancouver International Airport, uh, voted uh, the best airport in the world for eight years in a row, wow. Uh, and the, the Public uh, Policy Forum of Ottawa. Uh, you have an outstanding lineup of expert speakers and panelists. We welcome uh, Ambassador uh, Ken Merton from the State Department, Martin Loken, uh, the Minister for Political Affairs of the Can Canadian Embassy, uh, Vincent Rigby, Associate Deputy uh, Minister for Public Safety in Canada, Laurie McDonald, Assistant Deputy Minister for Transport Canada, as well as presidents and CEOs of leading travel and transportation companies. And many of the guests here today are equally expert in their fields. It's a great platform to launch serious discourse that will inform policy making about uh, the nor northern border, a great example of how the Wilson Center attempts to fulfill its mission. On behalf of all of us at the Wilson Center, I wish you a productive and successful conference. Thank you very much, Rob Litvak. 
And uh, as Rob said, we're very pleased to have as our opening keynoter this morning, Ambassador Kenneth Merton. Uh, since August of 2015, he has been a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, overseeing, among other things in a vast uh, portfolio, the Canadian Affairs file. He was U.S. Ambassador to Croatia from 2012 to 2015, and the U.S. Ambassador to Haiti from 2009 to 2012. There, he directed the U.S. government's on-the-ground relief efforts after the 2010 earthquake, and that included the, president, the, the presence of some 8,000 U.S. military personnel uh, and a huge evacuation effort. Uh, for that, he received the 2011 Ryan Crocker Award for Outstanding Leadership in Expeditionary Diplomacy. Uh, and having worked with Ambassador Merton at that time, I can tell you it was very well deserved indeed. Ambassador Merton served as Deputy Executive Secretary, both to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and to her predecessor, Condoleezza Rice. He's held numerous leadership roles and economic affairs positions during his diplomatic career. And thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Merton. Thanks so much for those kind words, Lynn. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Wilson Center. Um, if I could begin by echoing Vice President Litvak's welcome and by thanking all of you for coming together to discuss today what are clearly important issues for both Canada and the United States, uh, the integrity of our mutual border and the need to facilitate legitimate trade and travel along the longest shared border in the world. We are the closest of neighbors, the United States and Canada, but we live in troubled times. The need for strong security at our, at our borders has never been more important. Each year, millions of people enter our two nations by air, land, and sea routes. Most come intending merely to visit. Some come to legally immigrate, fully intending to join our populations and contribute to our nation's futures. However, a very small group come with malign intentions. While on the one hand we work closely together to mitigate these concerns, we also strive to preserve the special trade relationship that exists between our two countries, a relationship based on the free movement of people and goods across our borders. Bilateral trade between the U.S. and Canada has reached once unimaginable levels. Every day, 1.9 million billion U.S. dollars in goods and services flow across the border, as well as nearly 400,000 people. Trade has brought enormous wealth to both our nations and has resulted in more efficient utilization of resources and production of goods. In 2017, 75 percent of Canada's total export goods were shipped to the United States, while 65 percent of its imported goods came from the U.S. Facilitating that trade and travel, the United States and Canada share 120 land ports of entry stretching from our western states and provinces where Poker Creek meets Little Gold Creek on the top of the World Highway in Alaska, Yukon, to the Plains Territory where Pembina, North Dakota, shares a crossing with Emerson, Manitoba, to the east of our countries at the ports of entry of Clare, Fort Kent in Maine, New Brunswick. In addition, there are 200,000 annu annual flights and numerous commercial Recreation ves recreational vessels crossing maritime borders and entering maritime ports of entry, such as the Port, port uh, Angeles, Goat Haunt, and Detroit Windsor Ferry Terminals. It is vital for our governments to ensure trade and travel between the United States and Canada and to make sure that that is as made as easy and efficient as possible, all while maintaining the integrity and security of our borders. We are committed to an upgraded and modernized NAFTA as we seek to build upon our important trade rela relationship with Canada. Our overall goal is to seek fair and reciprocal trade with all of our trade partners. While our Canadian colleagues in ministries such as Public Safety and the Canadian Border Services Agency, uh, w w uh, our Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to facilitate cross-border trade and movement. At last count, the United States had positioned 430 Customs and Border Protection officers at eight Canadian airports to inspect travelers prior to their flights for entry into the United States. 
This means a Canadian citizen flying out of the cold at James Armstrong Richardson International Airport in Winnipeg to Orlando, Florida for the f- for the winter can immediately enter the United States without being delayed for customs inspection upon landing at the U.S. airport, thereby reaching Disney World that much more quickly. <laughs> and I would note spending some uh, some uh, Canadian dollars in U.S. territory, which we always like. <laughs> Similarly, our Canadian neighbors are taking steps to facilitate this pre-clearance effort. The Agreement on Land, Rail, Marine, and Air Transport Preclearance, or LRMA, signed by our two countries in March 2015, allows for expansion of preclearance and other modes of transportation and new locations. With royal assent given this past December to Canada's implementing legislation for our agreement, we look forward to its implementation and being able to expand coverage to places such as Billy Bishop uh, Toronto City Airport and the Rocky Mountaineer Train. We continue to explore posting CBP personnel at rail and port facilities to enable similar advanced inspection of goods and people, thus ha- helping to prevent backlogs at, at our ports of entry, particularly at land crossings. It is safe to say that no other country has the degree of preclearance cooperation from the United States that Canada has. Our most advanced baggage monitoring and biometric technologies are employed to speed movement across the border while enhancing our shared security. While Canada has not yet deployed inspection personnel to the United States to facilitate preclearance movement to Canada, we hope to see steps on this in the near future. Perhaps in a pilot project in Scottsdale or Fort Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for an example. Such deployments can only help make cross-border commerce and travel more efficient. With the world growing smaller every day, we look to these and other programs to further facilitate trade and travel flows as new preclearance sites are opened and as inspection and review technologies improve to meet the demand. This is what brings us all here today. Your innovative work in the areas of border management systems, inspection tools, and other technological enhancements will help shape the future of border cooperation. I'll be very interesting to read about your conclusions and recommendations for facilitating further border cooperation. And I really wish you tremendous success in the discussions today. Sadly, I'm not going to be able to be here for it, but I know that uh, given the attendance here, uh, there's bound to be some really good discussions uh, ahead of us here. So anyway, thank you very much for allowing me to join you today, and I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ken Merton. Um, Ambassador Merton uh, is so well known that he's often trailed by paparazzi, uh, as you can tell. Uh, no, seriously, uh, the uh, Wilson Institute is uh, going to be having its uh, big uh, global uh, board meeting uh, over the next few days, and uh, the uh, team here is shooting a promotional video. So thank you very much for allowing us to uh, to do that uh, among you uh, this morning. Um, Before we go into our first panel, I want to introduce uh, Jerry Bruno um, and also to point out uh, uh, Jane Hooker. Uh, Jerry Bruno is with the Vancouver International Airport, where he is the vice president for federal government affairs. Um, And uh, Jane Hooker is representing the Public Policy Forum of Ottawa. So uh, Jerry is going to come up and say a few words. But Jane, if you could just wave out. There she is. Uh, We'll be hearing from uh, Jane and Jerry both uh, in a longer form that presentation uh, later today. But I must say, it has truly been a pleasure collaborating with Jerry uh, and the YVR airport team uh, and Solomon Wong of InterVistas to organize today's event and to do the work of strategizing on larger beyond the border uh, pre-clearance issues. We're going to hear uh, the presentations that I mentioned later, but for now, Jerry is going to outline the vision for our Beyond the Border preclearance partnership and identify our uh, generous sponsors for this effort. Jerry. Well, thank you, Lynn. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really nice to see a lot of uh, friend and col- friends and colleagues in the, in the room today. Uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, echo Lynn's words and, and thank the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, Canada Institute for being such a great partner. I mean, Lynn and her team have done a, a terrific job of, of planning and organizing this event. And 
it's uh, truly been an honor to, uh, to, to be part of this, uh, this forum today. Uh, this is the first of a number of planned activities under our Beyond Preclearance Initiative. And uh, as Lynn mentioned, I'm going to talk uh, a bit more detail about that this afternoon. But for now, I just wanted to say a few words on how we got here, why we're doing this, and uh, just give you a glimpse of, of where we're planning to go with this. As, as uh, has been uh, uh, mentioned, uh, in December of 2017, uh, Canada finally uh, passed the uh, preclearance agreement. Uh, long overdue, uh, very embarrassing uh, for us from up north. I was getting harassed every time I came down to DC by our friends at Homeland Security and CBP. What are you guys doing? And what's taking so long? Especially since, since the US Congress had passed it a year earlier. But anyway, it's, it's done and, uh, and that's great. Uh, but this, uh, this new agreement, which is a multimodal preclearance agreement, was one of the key objectives under the five-year Perimeter Security Beyond the Border Action Plan. And, and this plan was set for five years initially, but there was every intention to move to the next phase, which was affectionately referred to as uh, BTB 2.0. So that, you know, we, we need acronyms in our industry, right? And, and around that time, uh, our, both our governments, U.S. And, and Canada, reached out to industry looking for input and ideas on how do we improve uh, the movement of legitimate travelers and goods while strengthening uh, the security of our borders and, and transportation systems. A lot of us did that, but unfortunately, for over two years, there has been no real movement on a future cross-border agenda. BTB 2.0 came to a grinding halt, and a lot of those good ideas provided by industry are still sitting on the shelf. So for a lot of us, there was this sort of sense of unfinished business uh, on our border relationship. So last fall, uh, I started a conversation with, with uh, some of our partners and in the industry in Canada, CBSA, public safety, and did the same down here with our friends at CBP. And, and homeland, and it's sort of like, where do we go next? What can we do beyond the preclearance agreement? We've got that, that's great, but, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And one of the driving factors, of course, is, is uh, traffic uh, was continuing to grow at unprecedented high rates, uh, while border and security resources were more constrained than ever. And, and you, you, you can't close the, uh, you know, the, the, the trying to close the expanding gap between that growth and border and security capacity, and that's capacity both in terms of resources and infrastructure, without changing how we do things at the border. And what this means is we, we need to continually evolve borders and security management. It means more innovation in developing process convergence solutions, it means greater use of enabling technologies, including biometrics, which we'll, we'll hear a lot about today. And that's what's needed to, to both increase speed and enhance security. Those two are, 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 are not opposing objectives. Uh, they, they've got to come together. Now, there's been some who've questioned whether this is the right time to tackle the U.S.-Canada border relationship. We do have a number of thorny trade disputes, uh, and NAFTA still uh, remains unresolved. But the reality is that no matter what happens with NAFTA, the border is still going to be there. And the longer we wait to do anything about it, the bigger the challenges we will face down the road. We're already playing catch up, and it's only going to get worse. But I am very excited that these informal conversations uh, from just a few months ago have actually led to the formation of a binational, industry-driven, beyond preclearance coalition. And some of our initial partners uh, in this initiative are, are listed on the screen behind me. Uh, I'll talk a bit more uh, about that this afternoon. Uh, so far, we've raised almost $200,000, uh, primarily for the development of a Beyond Preclearance uh, white paper, but also to support a number of these associated conferences and roundtables that we'll talk about a little later. later. This initiative is actually a reboot of the Binational Perimeter Clearance Coalition that some of us here in this room were involved with almost 20 years ago. That cooperative effort resulted in the publication of the Perimeter Clearance Strategy 
and that provided substantive input to the Ridge Manley Smart Border Accord of December 2001. As a matter of fact, 27 out of the 32-point uh, Smart Border Action Plan were recommendations out of that perimeter strategy white paper. So we're optimistic that our new Beyond Preclearance Initiative can have the same level of influence in generating a new joint vision and strategy for the border. I'll be back later today to give you a few more details on our coalition, the white paper, and where we plan to go from here. We also expect that today's presentations and discussions will generate enough material to fill several chapters of the Beyond Preclearance White Paper. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, and please ask lots of questions and share our th your thoughts and ideas because that's what we're looking for out of this process. Thanks, and now back to you, Lynn. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite uh, our first panel to uh, come up and take the stage. Uh, moderating our first panel is Martin Loken, who is the Minister for Political Affairs at the Embassy of Canada here in Washington. And uh, Martin has been a senior trade negotiator on air transport agreements and intellectual property. Uh, and from 2008 to 2012, he served as Canada's Consul General for the Upper Midwestern United States. Now, uh, I've taken a look at uh, the issues that he deals with typically <laughs> in uh, the course of a day, and it's uh, really impressive. Among the broad-ranging program responsibilities he has are public safety, homeland security, border security, and immigration. I can't think of a better person to lead us off uh, in this first panel than Martin Loken. <coughs> Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lynn. And uh, I am pleased to, uh, to be here with uh, four real experts uh, in, uh, in their domains. And I think it's going to be a, a terrific way to, uh, to kick off the, uh, the, uh, the conversation today. Uh, we'll be uh, getting into uh, the facts and uh, the trends and what does that mean for the borders. Uh, let me just say very, very quickly a thank you to the organizers and, uh, you know, from the perspective of the uh, Embassy of Canada here in Washington, this really is an important event and uh, very encouraged by the, uh, the terrific turnout. Uh, we heard earlier from uh, Ambassador Merton a number of uh, figures about uh, the trade and, uh, and movement across the border. And uh, you know, another, another one is uh, you look at uh, across the U.S., there's about 9 million jobs that are supported by uh, trade and investment uh, with Canada. Uh, Canada is by far and away the biggest customer for what the United States sells to the world. Uh, we're number one customer for uh, over two-thirds of the, uh, the states in the U.S. So, you know, these are among the reasons why it's very, very important to have a, a border that, uh, that functions uh, smoothly uh, for uh, legitimate uh, commerce and travel and also uh, is, uh, meets the imperatives of security, which, uh, after all, is job one for governments. And I can certainly attest from my brief time here at the Embassy so far that uh, this is a very, very... Uh, strong area of cooperation uh, between the many different departments and agencies of the Canadian government that are represented uh, in the embassy and their uh, uh, counterparts in the U.S. Uh, very, very strong collaboration on these important matters. So uh, to, uh, to, to kick us uh, off here, I'm going to turn first. Uh, the, I won't give long introductions to our, uh, our distinguished panelists. <coughs> I think all the information is in your, uh, is in your packages. But uh, we're going to hear first from, uh, from Tony Smith, who is the uh, managing director of Fortinus Global Limited, uh, former DG of the UK Border Force. And he's going to talk to us about uh, the international travel and threat environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. I bring you greetings from across the pond from London, England, United Kingdom. Uh, great to be uh, here in this lovely city of Washington, D.C. Uh, again. Um, I'm going to try and keep my presentation as brief as possible because the object is to talk to you rather than to talk at you. Uh, but I have got a, a few slides which I wanted to run through. Um, so, first of all, if I can work this thing... Uh, a little bit about me, for those of you that don't know me, I do see a few friends in the audience of time, from times gone by, but I was over here uh, between 2000 and 2003, which was a very significant period, on an exchange program between the UK Home Office and Citizenship and Immigration Canada 
And uh, you will recall that that's when 9-11 um, when happened and I found myself down here as part of the uh, Canadian delegation sitting behind a maple leaf, <laughs> this English guy, uh, as director of ports of entry in Canada uh, on something called Hands Across the Border. I don't know if you remember that, but the Hands Across the Border initiative, we had a memorandum of cabinet and there was an agreement, Commissioner Judge Bonner, who is a good friend of mine now, I keep in touch with Rob regularly, was leading the US delegation when Homeland was formed and we did a lot of things then which will resonate with you and which you're still talking about now guys uh, 15 years later on in terms of what we were going to do with that border and what's going to happen next with that border. Um, that was a really a big lesson for all of us wasn't it in border security uh, and then I went back to the UK I got to the job of the director of ports of entry in the UK immigration service and then 7-7 happened. Uh, which was the worst ever terrorist attack on the London metro system where 49 people lost their lives. And uh, we then came across this new concept of homegrown terrorism. These were people who actually were British passport holders, born and bred in the UK, turned on their own country and had been traveling across borders to train uh, in terrorist centers abroad. And we hadn't spotted that. We were looking at the foreign threat. So I learned quite a lot in that time about border security. And I guess there was an inevitability that they were going to ask me to take charge of border security for the London 2012 Olympic Games. Just wanted to say thank you again to my friends from Vancouver here because you guys had Vancouver 2010 and I came over and I learned a heck of a lot from you guys about how to manage a major event and get that number of people across the border whilst doing risk assessments at the same time. And then I, I went back, I did the Olympics and that one worked, that went well. Uh, uh, fortunately for all of us and uh, then I was asked to stick around for a little while be the director general of the UK border force while they found somebody else I'd done 40 years by then I thought that was quite enough uh, in government and uh, you can see I look much more relaxed in the bottom picture than I did in the, <laughs> the top picture when I was still wearing my uniform so so that's a bit about me so I mean when we you know when we talk about borders and, and these are sort of I spend a lot of time running around the world talking at events uh, with different border agencies you know, but the, the, the threats are generally pretty generic. Uh, you know, they may be more stark in different parts of the world than others, but, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, you know, some of the, the threats. that you're, these, these are all the things now that we're worried about, isn't it, at the border? And, and increasingly, countries are merging their agencies together uh, into single border. You led the way on that with, with Homeland and CBP, but CBSA, then we did with the single border force. The Australians have just created the Australian Border Force in 2015. So increasingly, there's this pressure for, for border agencies to work across silos to, to share people, information and skills behind a consolidated uh, broad risk assessment against the broad range of threats that we're all facing there. Uh, I don't, I'd rather than spend sort of too long on just looking a few hundred miles north, I just wanted to take you a few thousand miles east of here um, because, you know, if you think you've got uh, problems here... Uh, this was this was my uh, bailiwick. Um, I had about 8,000 staff in the UK Border Force when I was running it. Uh, those are the challenges that we had. Obviously, uh, you know, threats uh, of, of trying to identify illegal migration in an environment. Yeah, I mean, we are surrounded by water, you know, generally. So, so that helps. Someone built a tunnel uh, to France. It <laughs> didn't really help <laughs> from my point of view. <laughs> because uh, we had to do something about that but generally those, that, that was, those are the challenges that I was facing and how do you how do you manage all that on a pretty limited budget about 600 million pound a year uh, with 8,000 staff and you know make sure that you don't let anyone through that you shouldn't have done and you don't have any long queues at the airport because then the airport people will get onto you and start complaining about it right Jerry so uh, so those were the sort of challenges and now I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this because you know, you may or may not have heard about this. I don't know how much you've seen about this, um, but we're going to be leaving the European Union. Uh, and uh, they're calling it Brexit. But I just wanted to show you these borders because that top map there is going to, you know, just maybe make you feel a bit more comfortable about what's happening here. I mean, if when we leave the European Union, um, that up until now, we've had this thing called free movement of people and goods across borders in in the European Union. So if you if you fly into France and y you know you want to travel around the Schengen area there won't be any border checks. So in all that blue zone there you can just wander around. Uh, no one's going to stop you. There's no customs or immigration checks at all. Uh, we never actually joined at Schengen so, so that's why we're red because we still check people coming from there. 
Um, but the big problem we, we have is when we leave the single market uh, and the customs union, we will have to start imposing checks upon goods and people uh, you know, crossing from uh, the EU into the UK. We don't do that now, so we're looking at a probably five-fold increase in customs declarations, uh, most of which is going to come across that uh, Dover-Calais uh, uh, route. A huge uh, issue with our systems and whether we're, you know, we haven't built a system capable of handling that number of customs declarations. And, of course, a huge problem on the island of Ireland, Ireland where we don't want a land border. We really don't want a land border in Ireland, ladies and gentlemen, because we've got something called the Good Friday Agreement, uh, where we've worked very, very hard to rebuild relationships between the North and the South. And by putting officials and obstacles on that border, it's going to raise co political connotations that are going to be uh, probably worse than anything we're trying to achieve in terms of border management and customs controls. So, you know, the, 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 the message I suppose there is that the dynamic can change and does change uh, with the times, with politics. When, you know, big decisions are made about exemptions or the lack of exemptions or the cessation of exemptions, that can have a massive effect on border control. And frankly, you know, in the UK, I haven't got answers for all of these questions, but I hear things now about hard and soft borders. You know, it kind of sounds a bit like boiled eggs to me. Now, what's a hard border? What's a soft border? What are we, I mean, 45 years I've been working in borders. Someone just made this up, right? Um, but what do you mean by soft border control? And what, um, and what are, and all the guys, you know, from technology, all the systems guys that are coming in with, you know, the blockchain and the biometrics, and how is that going to be using? This is causing huge headaches back home. So I, I just wanted to, I thought that was one dimension I could bring to this party which would give you a sort of broader look about what you're trying to do uh, on, your, on, your, on your land border uh, here, on your border between US and Canada. Because, you know, I can tell you from my own experiences, you are held up around the world as a model of excellence, actually, in the way that you have constructed your, uh, your uh, borders in, in North America. And uh, you have been quoted in a number of government papers in the UK. Uh, there are references that about, you know, the sorts of things that can be done with the right uh, spirit of cooperation between two uh, independent sovereign states, which we haven't really seen, I'm afraid, in, in, in other parts of the world. So these are the things I'm going to leave you with uh, and, and hand you into the, uh, into the discussion, really. These are the things that have stuck with me through all these years, whether in government or not. Three fundamental principles of border management that if you don't remember anything else, uh, just remember these three, um, because these are the ones inter- Integrated border management. Have you heard of integrated border management? That was the major failing in 9-11. That was a major failing in the Paris attacks of 2015. This is where you have a number of different government departments and agencies not working collaboratively with one another, not sharing information across government and, and not properly uh, uh, co coordinating uh, response and risk assessments. That was something I worked very hard on on London 2012 Olympics to make sure that all the players, be they police, security, uh, national or state, uh, immigration or customs worked together across those borders to, to, to make sure that we, we eliminated risks um, together. And a lot of the stuff that's been built over here, like the targeting centres, um, the, the integrated enforcement teams, they are now held up as good examples of integrated border management where you have multi-agency uh, uh, groups like that risk assessing people. The multiple border strategy, if you're an academic and you're interested in all that, that actually began in Canada. Yeah, that's where it first uh, all, all started. But multiple borders is where you are leading the way. And this is about pre-clearance. This is about checking people and goods before they arrive at your frontier. In whatever way you can. Physical pre-clearance, certainly, if you can do that. But electronic pre-clearance becoming increasingly relevant. The more checks and risk assessments and balances you can do on people and goods before they turn up, the much better chance you've got of facilitating their arrival, which you all want to do when they get to your border. Um, so so uh, multiple border strategy is the second one. And the third one is the main reason I'm actually in town is uh, there's an identity conference going on downstairs, no ID. Uh, but, you know, this identity problem of how do we know where somebody, who somebody is? Have we got them locked down into an identity that we can all agree? Can we share biometric and biographic data across borders against international watch lists to prevent terrorist travel, to prevent criminals tar uh, traveling is a big mission of mine. And I go around the world preaching uh, at the end-to-end -end identity continuum and how we can all work together to deliver those challenges that our keynote talked about, about in terms of 99.9% .9 genuine traffic getting cleared quickly 
quickly through the border. I've heard it referred to as removing uh, the haystack, I think, to find the needle. Those kinds of principles are the key, three key principles of, uh, of, of international border management, in my view. And uh, that is, of course, within the constraints of policy, legislation, privacy, and so on, which you will no doubt be talking about during this event. Uh, so uh, I think that's about it from me. I'll, uh, I'll shut up now and, and let you get on with the panel, but obviously happy to take questions either as part of this panel or later on if you want to grab me later. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, very much, Tony, for, uh, for that uh, overview. So I'll turn next to uh, Kevin Burke, who is the President and CEO of Airports Council North America, uh, and he's going to talk to us about the uh, U.S.-Canada air travel. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And good morning. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, Craig? Oh, I don't have a presentation. Oh, I don't do slides. My staff knows to keep slides away from Kevin. Um, <laughs> and so they're wise to keep me away from slides. Um, first of all, um, Jerry, thank you for organizing. I helped to organize this. And Craig, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. This is the second time we've done this. We were in Vancouver, was it two years ago we did this? It was a great start, and let's continue this. Um, as you might expect for U.S. airports, since uh, ACINA is a combination of all the commercial airports in the United States and as well as Canada under the uh, Canadian Airports Council. So we work together, and as I look at it, and one of our former chairs used to say, um, we have to look beyond the horizon, and the horizon for us is our border to the north. Um, international travel is growing in the United States. Um, uh, tw we had a 22 percent increase at U.S. airports of entry over the last five years. That's a very big number. And last year, U.S. traffic grew 4.2 uh, percent, and more is expected, which is good. Um, each inbound passenger spends on average of $4,200 U.S. when they come into the United States. So as an economic issue, that's very important that international travel increases um, and that people get through our respective customs facilities in a reasonable amount of time. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that $4,200, when you multiply how many people are coming into the states and then vice versa with Canada, we're talking about a good deal of money that helps support our economies. Um, some airports are seeing faster growth than others, as we might expect. Um, and last year, Canadian international travel grew at a at a very healthy 6%. Um, and transborder traffic was even higher, and that was at 8%. And I have to suspect that there are Americans looking for refuge for the next three years in Canada um, and with relatives and friends, and then see what happens uh, later. But uh, that's just my opinion. The um, technology. Let's start with the good news here. Um, Technology is on the rise, and we had a meeting about a month or so ago in San Francisco. Our friends from Customs and Border Protection were there talking about bio, um, uh, bio entrance to, uh, to jet aircraft and um, in our airports. It's a very healthy discussion. We're talking about the future, um, but more needs to be done. Um, Customs and Border Protection processes 51 passengers per hour under what we call our automatic passport control kiosks. That's pretty good. That, that is way beyond where we were three, four years ago. Um, in Canada, uh, the automated boarding control kiosks have now involved, evolved, I should say, into the next generation primary inspection kiosks, PIK, which is allowing for the electronic processes in Canada uh, for CBSA. Um, <laughs> since March of 2017, 57% of passengers in Canada's major airports have processed through the PIK system. So mobile passport control here in the United States, which I, we are proud to say we had a great role in uh, Matt and his team at our ACINA, and Anil had helped develop that process. Um, we are now at 24 airports in the United States, and in 2017, 2.1 million passengers are using mobile passport control, and we expect that to uh, increase as the years go on. Now, we're looking forward to expanding MPC, simply for the fact that we want to be able to move passengers safely through the customs hall um, and safely and secure. That's the major reason why we have the, we don't want bad guys in um, at either end of the airport, especially customs. So we're looking forward to expanding MPC to more airports this year in the U.S. and to pre-clearance locations in Canada. And I always ask the question, and I was talking to Craig earlier, about pre-clearance um, airports in Canada. Now, we can pre-clear at about eight airports in Canada, U.S., back to the United States, which is very, very helpful to us. 
uh, we're going to have to look at reversing that and, and looking going from large hub airports to other large airports in Canada and having the same situation. So Canadian citizens flying back to Canada do not have to clear in Canada. They can clear in the United States. Now, we're not anywhere close to that now, but I envision that is the future uh, in our relationship. Uh, we're looking to we're working to evolve technology. Uh, to provide greater convenience, security, and efficiency at more passengers at all of our airports. Last year, we processed in just the United States about 830 million passengers. We expect that by the uh, in five years that that number will go to a billion passengers um, in a system that was designed for about half of that. So there's an infrastructure issue here, but technology has obviously made a big deal in being able to um, hasten the flow of traffic through our airports. So. Well, the good news is technology. The bad news is staffing on both sides of the border. It's an economic issue, ladies and gentlemen. And I can give you great examples of airports in the United States, and I assume in Canada, where uh, they are bringing in new international traffic and having the challenge of being able to have customs officials greeting these flights at somewhat, would say, irregular hours. Um, so if the goal is to bring in more air service to the United States and Canada, the challenge is how do our friends at Customs staff that with the budget they're given by, not themselves, that my guess is if they had their choice, they'd have all the officers they need, all the budget they would need, but they have to go through a thing called Congress. And in Canada, you have to go through Parliament to be at those numbers. The reality is, is that we don't have enough officers to be able to handle the amount of inbound traffic at irregular hours. And for U.S. airports in particular, that's a problem. Um, Technology can only get you so far. As good as it is, it can only get you uh, federal resources uh, uh, for Customs and Border Protection is essential for us to be able to maintain that flow of passengers between our two borders. Um, you have to raise staffing levels. The only way they're going to be able to do that is convince our Congress that this is important for the economy of both of our countries. Since pr previous speakers have talked about the importance of our economic relationship, this is something we really need to, con uh, to, to concentrate on because the amount of dollars crossing our border on a daily basis is staggering. Um, the last thing we want to be doing as a nation is reversing that and saying making it more difficult for our friends in Canada to come into the United States and vice versa. Um, airports have to be innovative uh, to ensure the facilities and processes can meet the growing demand. And what does that mean? That means airports that were built 40 years ago have to look at themselves and say, well, are these the airports we need now? And how do we build airports to accommodate the growing need for security at both sides of the airport? And that's at one end of the airport's customs for inbound international, and the other end is a TSA for our passengers in the United States and others leaving the United States to make sure that that secure area of the airport is truly secure. Now, collaboration between the U.S. and Canada, that is not, an, that is not a hard subject to talk about because, as I see it, we have tremendous collaboration. With the amount of trade we do every year, uh, we cross the border every day, millions and millions and millions of times with no instance at all. Um, governments, our, both of our governments, need to consider how to increase efficiency and also to maintain security. Uh, they need to exchange data better, in my view, um, and ask for more streamlined processes uh, for people coming into both of our countries. Uh, they need to adapt similar technologies. We have to have technologies that are talking to one another. They can't be one different system in Canada, one different system in the United States. They have to talk to one another. Um, Customs trusted traveler programs, including Global Entry and Nexus, are a great example of how collaboration works. Uh, I think we can enhance that as we move on. Uh, these programs now have 6.8 million members and growing. Um, we should be encouraging people to use these programs. Because a great example, I have a daughter who lives in New York who had uh, got her uh, uh, TSA uh, pre-check. She called me from LaGuardia and said, that was the best $75 I've ever spent. My boyfriend's still standing in line, and I'm going to see him in about an hour. And so I said, okay, well, get your boyfriend to buy TSA as well. So bottom line is it works. Global entry continues to expand to new countries. And last year, CBP added four more countries, now available in 11 countries around the world, which is tremendous. So, again, I'm going to get back to infrastructure. Uh, you can't modernize technology without looking at the infrastructure in which we have to operate. 
It's a little bit different in Canada. They have a different funding system. In the United States, we are well behind our friends around the world in terms of taking, on average, 40-year-old terminals and, and making 21st century airports out of them. Uh, we need to work on that. The only way technology works is if you streamline the system. Uh, do you need redundancies at the gate? As much as bio uh, uh, looks tremendous, is it going to actually speed people getting onto planes? Are we going to know more about that passenger at the gate than we knew when they entered the airport? Uh, Craig and I were talking about this before uh, we started here today. So infrastructure is very important. But the reality is the reason why I'm here today is, A, because I was asked. <laughs> B, Canada is an enormously important part of our portfolio as ACINA. But more importantly, I see our trade and our visits continuing and, and getting bigger and better. Um, there's no reason for us as two countries to put impediments in the way to make it more difficult to cross our borders, despite the challenges that Martin said about um, we live in a dangerous world. Uh, the friendliest crossings in the world are between the United States and Canada. And my view is let's keep it that way. But with a caveat that as friendly as we are, we have to make sure that the bad guys don't get in on either side. And that means that we have to be vi vigilant in our approach and unified as well. So, Martin, uh, that is my presentation. I uh, look forward to questions later. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Kevin. So we'll move from the air to the land, and we're going to hear from uh, Jennifer Fox, who is the Vice President for International Trade Policy and Canada Relations with the North American Strategy for Competitiveness. So we'll talk about the land border. Jennifer. Laura Dawson in the Canada Institute for the invitation to be here today. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Jennifer Fox. Um, I'm a trucker. I've been talking truck and cross-border transportation and trade for, can you hear me better? For 20 years. So I started when I was eight. <laughs> Are you laughing? <laughs> Why does everybody laugh at that? Um, yeah, so I'm a trucker as evidenced by what I real now realize is a Bud Light pen in my <laughs> hand. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to speak really, uh, really common and off the cuff with you. Um, basically, I'm done. I think every, all of my speaking notes have already been said by Jerry and by Kevin. So thanks, guys. <laughs> we like truckers. Yeah. <laughs> um, all my, my speaking notes are exactly the same thing that we've already heard, which I think is just a testament to how true it, it actually is, that the problems are the same across the board. Um, Kevin, uh, I loved your presentation. I think it's uh, definitely interesting to hear um, the tourism stats, and I can't wait to see what will happen when um, marijuana is legal in Canada. How many U.S. Um, citizens are coming on up across the border? Oh, <laughs> for that. they'll be flooding it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we see what they're doing at Edmonton. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I travel quite a bit, and I have to say that the airport technology, it's, it's pretty amazing. Every time I go through Pearson, I'm just blown away. And uh, granted, I, I go through Pearson more often than Vancouver, so it's, it's not that I don't love the Vancouver airport. Um, but I'm always just blown away by how quickly the, the technology is being implemented and the progress that's made. Um, I have to say, unfortunately, uh, commercial trucking is not as fast. And um, for small, medium-sized businesses that are looking to expand into interprovincial, uh, interstate, and for the purposes of today, um, international trade, uh, international trade markets, this is a huge challenge. So um, I'm going to talk about the two major barriers to um, efficient goods movement, which are, um, from my perspective, um, lack of harmonization and a lack of resources. Uh, a lack of resources to the existing technology that we do have, which um, unfortunately leaves us with a broken system. And while we forge ahead and we look to future technologies, if we can't fix and put resources into that which already exists, we're essentially almost painting over uh, a, a rust stain. And what will happen is we will be in the same situation when we start to implement some of these future technologies. So I just want to uh, go back to, to Jerry's point about how, you know, we're already playing catch up. Um, yeah. Beyond the Border was great, but for two years, all the good ideas have been sitting on a shelf. I mean, these are all great comments, Jerry, because you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we have to change things that we do at the border with innovation and technology and looking to biometrics. Yes, yes, we do. But we already have existing technologies today that unfortunately we're just not leveraging. Um, and let's face it, from a political standpoint, these are not sexy things. Uh, putting money towards the ACE system and RFID and e-manifest and putting money and resources and people behind those things just aren't sexy. It's not getting government attention, so it's not getting money. Um, 
the people, the resources at CBP and CBSA are doing a great job. I mean, they hear us. They, I, I think it's evident every time we talk to them and they're, they're, they're trying to inch away as best they can and chip away as best they can with what they have. They just don't have enough. Um, so I don't, I don't want to get too sidetracked because I only have 10 minutes. I have a lot to say. Bear with me. I'm a fast talker. I've had a lot of coffee, so here I go. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to lack of harmonization really quick and just talk about this. So from a, from a trucking industry perspective and from me, you know, a small company um, starting up and I want to start doing some trade between Ontario and Michigan and I'm looking at crossing the border and, or I'm a trucking company and I want to start crossing the border, what am I facing? Um, two different processes, two different technologies. There's RFID at the border into the United States and transponders on those trucks not coming into Canada. The definition of trusted trader programs is different if you're going into the United States or coming into Canada. The timing requirements for pre-arrival for e-manifest are different if you're going into the United States and coming into Canada. Imagine trying to train your staff on this or being a truck driver and entering the market and, and trying to figure out what, what do I do when and, and what program do I have to belong to? The fast lane requirements are different, whether you're going into the United States or Canada. The in-transit process, which um, was a success under Beyond the Border in terms of implementing a pilot to allow those moves, moves to happen again, unfortunately, electronic into the States, paper into Canada, presenting also another challenge I'll get to in a minute. Allowable weights and dimensions. Um, you can have double 53s in Ontario, can't have them in the States. In some States you can. Um, double 28s in Mexico, not into the States. And there's more to come on that. Um, province to province, same thing. Uh, weights and dimensions are challenges. State to state, same thing. Um, and things like empty trailer repositioning. I wouldn't be me for those of you who know me if I didn't raise that. Um, two drivers where we could have one. Two drivers doing exactly the same thing where we could have one. Um, this in a market where we've got a driver shortage of 20,000 in Canada by 2020 and 50,000 in the United States by 2020. So we have to start doing more with less, which I think we've already uh, heard. Um, and then lack of resources, uh, I'm just going to quickly touch on that. ACE is a 13-year-old system, and unfortunately, it just hasn't been maximized. The potential for that system is there. Um, but with, without government funding, without some federal money behind it to really make it what it could be, it's, it's just going to continue to fall short, unfortunately. FAST, that bi-national ID program, uh, lost 20,000 card-holding applicants in the last seven years. 20,000, that's huge. Um, that's not even as great as uh, the number of drivers that we're going to lose in the next three years. So what do we do then? So even these trusted traders that are um, taking their time, money, effort, energy to belong to these trusted trader programs, they can't find drivers to move their freight. We, we've got to do something about that. Um, part of the problem is those that have the card aren't using it for trusted purposes. They're not using it to move freight. They're mu using it to move things like hazardous material, which is non-trusted freight, and they're using it um, in Canada anyway for employment screening purposes. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, I already talked about in transit being paper uh, coming into Canada and electronic uh, for the U.S. Now, here's the thing. So under Beyond the Border, the in-transit process, which I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but it's basically Canadian goods moving domestic, in domestic goods in transit through the United States. It's a huge, huge efficiency gain. It's a huge efficiency gain for the trucking industry. It's a huge efficiency gain for... Um, for the shippers and also it brings truckers into and through those northern border states which you know they they want money they want they want the money to be spent on gas on resources on food on hotels and that's what the truckers would do if they could transit through the united states so under beyond the border we implemented a pilot we made a huge progress with cbp and cbsa it was great and then we find out that we can't expand the pilot because in the u.s we have a paperwork reduction act and unfortunately because the canada process is paper the U.S. doesn't want to entertain something that's going to require their officers to handle more paper to help work with Canada. Well, in Canada, we can't get the money to make the process electronic. This thing that has been limited to, I think, nine or less companies able to use it, which could be used by every company that's transiting right now through northern Canada, which is added cost, added GHG emissions. It's taking drivers away because it takes them so much longer, like days longer, to transit all across Canada than they could through the United States. So all of these things are, are so linked together. And then resources, the trusted portal. Speaking from a Canadian perspective, I know that um, CBP is working hard on their CTPAP portal, and I know that they're making progress there. In Canada, I just spoke last week to CBSA about their trusted portal. It is it is weak. I'm sorry if that sounds mean, but it's awful. And to, to put money behind that and make it what it really could be, that's what industry needs. These, these things that seem so easy um, without money behind them and without more people behind them because the people that are there, they get it. They, they know what they're doing. They're good. They're working hard, but they need more. They need more people. They need more money. 
Um, so what else? Where am I going with this? Okay, so um, the last thing I wanted to say is we need an established and rooted consultative mechanism between all three countries, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, and um, the stakeholders. I think beyond the border was probably the best thing that, well, I've seen anyway in my lifetime, and I'm only 28, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, you're laughing at that. Um, unfortunately, where did it go? What the heck? It's gone for two years, and and we were we were starting to make some progress there. So um, we're going to hear later today about a lot of um, the the technology that we're looking at, the emerging technology. It's all very exciting, um, autonomous vehicles and facial recognition and biometrics and blockchain and preclearance, which is great, and GPS track and trace. I mean, all of these things are great and they're sexy. People want to talk about them. We want to do something with them. But are we going to end up talking about these things ten years from now, saying? You know, it really could have worked so much better if we'd had the resources at the time to really, really implement it properly. And if history tells us anything, probably not, because we've got these systems today and technology today that exists that we haven't put the money behind to really maximize the efficiencies. So if I'm a truck driver or an SME today and I'm trying to get into the market, I'm trying to start trading, it is so confusing. It is so expensive. There are two different programs for this. Two different, two different fast cards. Or no, sorry, not two different. Two different requirements for your fast card. Two different requirements for the, for the fast lane. Two different time frames to remember. Is it 30 minutes? Is it an hour? Or is it nothing? I, I don't know. They're so confused, and so. In, a, in an environment where we have no capacity in the trucking market, there's a ton of freight capacity, there's no drivers, we're approaching a crisis, we've got technology, we're not using it, we're not putting money toward it, I think we're, we're headed for uh, a bit of a log jam. So that is my word of caution. And I don't, I don't mean to be doom and gloom because there's a lot of good things that have happened. And honestly, I think Beyond the Border was great. I think we've seen CBP and CBSA as a result of that talk to each other in ways we never saw before and it, and that work continues but they, they need money they need resources and they need those resources and that money not to, to be devoted to what is coming which is great we need to keep an eye on that but w what is happening right now today today right now this monday morning someone trying to cross the border with a with a full trailer load of freight or some company trying to you know trade for the first time what are they experiencing it's just uh, it's crazy so that's that's my rant thank you for listening to my passionate <laughs> soapbox <laughs> no. great well, well thank you very much uh, jennifer that was lots of uh, lots of practical examples of uh, of uh, of uh, barriers that uh, still remain to be addressed so thank you uh, thank you for that so our, uh, our final speaker on, on the panel is Dr. Lori Troutman, who is uh, with the Border Policy Research Director of the Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University. And I think she's going to talk to us about uh, passenger car traffic at the border. So. so this picture is just to get you all very excited about passenger vehicle traffic at the land border. This is the Peace Arch Crossing. And this picture, I think it was taken in 2002, but that's not to say that we don't still see lineups like this at the border. And this picture is part of the reason why my institute, the Border Policy Research Institute, exists. We were created after 9-11, largely out of a recognition that there was a huge disruption to the flow of goods and people at the border between BC and Washington. So the state wanted to create a research institute that was dedicated to doing applied research that could inform policy matters. We focus primarily on what's considered the Cascade Gateway region, which is a collection of five border crossings that feed the Interstate 5 corridor between Seattle and Vancouver. And a number of our research projects are done in conjunction with what's called the International Mobility and Trade Corridor Program, which is a collection of transportation and security agencies that meet monthly and do a lot of pilot projects. Um, some recent work that we've done, we did a border freight operations study that we completed where we talked to truck drivers, and we did origin and destination flows, and we found actually a lot of the things you were talking about, a lot of frustration with the trusted trader program. Fast usage in our region is something like 5% for loaded trucks. Um, it's higher for empties. Uh, we also do every five years a passenger vehicle intercept survey where we stop about 15,000 travelers <laughs> either before or after they cross the border and we ask them things like, where are you from? What's your trip purpose? Um, why aren't you using the Nexus Lane? And we have a lot of valuable information from those surveys. So I was asked to speak today about cross-border passenger car traffic. About 95% of the people crossing our land border are riding in cars, and so I think passenger vehicle trends can certainly tell us a lot about um, both economic but also social situations at the border, which can have a huge impact on border communities in particular, but also broader state economies as well. 
So this is a graph that shows you car traffic entering the U.S. All of the data I'm going to show you is, is U.S. centric. I use the U.S. stats over the last 20 years. And you can see overall we've seen a pretty steady decline in the number of passenger vehicles entering the U.S. from Canada. The blue line there is marking 9-11 to kind of give you an idea of the impact of 9-11 on that vehicle traffic. And in 2017, we saw the lowest volumes in over 20 years. And I had to double check these stats when I saw them because I thought, geez, they seem really like this huge dip. Uh, but that's what the Bureau of Transportation Statistics reports. Of course, the exception to this overall declining trend is that bump you see from around 2010 to 2013, which was when the Canadian dollar was very strong. So just to juxtapose the value of the Canadian dollar onto passenger vehicle traffic to give you an idea of the relationship between the two, we see some pretty interesting trends over the last 20 years. So in the 90s, there was a pretty relatively weak Canadian dollar, but we had very high volumes of passenger vehicles entering the U.S. from Canada. Um, and that there was a relationship between the two. Even though the Canadian dollar was weak and we had high volumes, we saw them move in tandem. Then 9-11 happened, and essentially we had this disruption to that relationship between the strength of the Canadian dollar and passenger vehicle crossings. And after 9-11, we saw the Canadian dollar strengthen, but our volumes didn't grow. They stayed pretty flat. And then the recession happened, and we kind of saw this return, I think, to that relationship between the strong Canadian dollar and higher volumes. Um, and then 2016, from 2016 to 2017, again, you see that dip even though the Canadian dollar remains strong. So obviously there's a lot of factors that drive and shape passenger vehicle volumes. The Canadian dollar is just one example that I wanted to give you today in the brief 10 minutes that I have. But my main point is to say that if we want to understand what's happening on the land border, we can't look at the border as a homogenous environment because regional trends vary considerably. And this graph gives you a sense of that. So these three regions comprise about 50% of the cars entering the United States. They're grouped here by clusters of entries, Detroit in green, Buffalo in blue, and the Cascade Gateway in red. And this is the same metric passenger vehicles entering the U.S. from Canada over the last roughly 20 years. And you can see that each of these regions reacted very differently to different events and different impacts. 9-11 had a really strong impact on Detroit. Volumes were already declining there, but after 9-11 happened, they continued to decline. On the other hand, 9-11 had almost no impact on the Cascade Gateway. We saw volumes rise in that post-9-11 environment. And Buffalo was sort of in between the two. Um, on the other hand, the strength of the Canadian dollar, that bump from 2010 to 2013, we saw the Cascade Gateway respond overwhelmingly to that, um, that strong Canadian dollar with virtually no impact on Detroit. And again, Buffalo sort of being in between a little bit of a response, but not as strong as the Cascade Gateway. An interesting thing, looking at the last year from 2016 to 2017, we saw all three regions sort of characterized by the same trends. So because of these regional variations, we know that there's differences in who is crossing the border and why. And the point I wanted to make today is that's really important to consider when we're thinking about innovations and what types of innovations will work at different border crossings, because they won't all have the same results in a homogenous sort of Canada-US environment. So I'm going to use the example of Nexus. And Nexus is going to be talked about probably more today. It already has been. But Nexus enrollment varies very widely by region. We see the highest enrollment in the Cascade Gateway. Numbers there are almost double what they are at Buffalo and almost triple what they are in Detroit. So as a result of that, we have about 50% of the crossers at that Peace Arch Crossing in Blaine using the Nexus Lane. That's fantastic. We're very excited about that. Our CBP and CBSA staffing out there is very, very proud of that. However, that still leaves half of the traffic crossing in the general purpose lanes. And this is in the region with the highest Nexus enrollment. So in the Cascade Gateway region, we see average wait times for non-Nexus travelers around 16 to 20 minutes. That's not, not too bad. But we still have peak delays of up to 40 minutes. And the problem with this is that it inserts variability and unpredictability into the system, which really thickens the border. And depending on how the approach to the Nexus lane is configured, this can thicken, configured, this can thicken the border for all travelers, not just non-Nexus travelers. So we find ourselves in a situation where we have lots of people in the general, general purpose lane, and we know from studies we've done that that's, that will continue. There will always be people that are not eligible for Nexus. So even though we want to continue to refine Nexus, continue to, to improve it, 
I think we don't want to lose sight of the fact that there will be people in that general purpose lane and we need to continue to refine that process as well. So how can we improve efficiency and security of those non-nexus flows given the limits that we have to staffing and infrastructure which have been have been mentioned already today. So I'm just going to walk through very briefly one pilot project we've done in the Cascade Gateway that looks at increasing the usage of RFID technology for non-Nexus users. So that's primarily looking at enhanced driver's licenses and passport cards with RFID chips in them. So I'm going to show you the results from a fieldwork and modeling project that we did with the International Mobility and Trade Corridor Program. Um, I won't get into the methodology, but I'm happy to speak to that later um, in the Q&A. And we did this to really understand if we could increase different levels of RFID usage in the non-nexus lane, how might we impact wait times at the PSARCH crossing? <coughs> so this graph and table essentially show different wait times associated with different levels of RFID usage. And this is a peak travel day at the PSARCH crossing. So this is throughout the day. And what we found is that processing time with an RFID document saves about 20 seconds per car because about a third of the inspection time is dealt with the officer getting the document, entering it in, and handing it back to the passenger. So 20 seconds for an individual is really not a big deal. <coughs> and that's why time savings from an RFID is only going to impact overall wait times if a large number of travelers are using those RFID documents. So through our modeling, we found that about 5% of the population at the PSARCH crossing use non-nexus RFID, and that's in that blue line and the blue, blue data in the table, table. If we could get that up to 20%, which is the red line, we would see average wait times reduced by about 45%. If we could get RFID usage up to 40%, which is that green line, our peak waits on busy travel days would decline from 90 minutes to 45 minutes. But this is going to look different depending on the crossing because there's a different population using different ports of entry. So as we innovate, I think we need to understand that difference between the ports of entry. And we have part of our pilot project, which I won't get into today, also makes a business case for how you would achieve this sort of RFID usage and what that cost would be. But I wanted to bring this up as an example of a simple way that we can innovate at the border using existing technologies without having to increase staffing or very costly infrastructure. So finally, I wanted to say in the Cascade Gateway region, we have an exceptional amount of knowledge about our land border, how it functions, who is crossing, what's crossing it, how those flows are changing, and how they might respond to different scenarios. The vast majority of this knowledge would not exist without an engaged relationship of mutual <coughs> trust and continual collaboration between the stakeholders in our region, security agencies, particularly transportation agencies, policymakers, governments, et cetera. So for us, I would say our strongest innovations are rooted in our partnerships and our collaboration. And I think innovation needs to come hand <coughs> in hand with that type of collaboration, that very close working relationship. At the same time, as we innovate, we have to be able to measure the effectiveness of these innovations. And it's very hard to compare performance across the border. Catherine Friedman and Bill Anderson and I are working on regional comparisons of border performance. And some of those really critical components, such as wait times and processing times, are not unified and they're not reported in the same way. We still have some ports of entry where a CBP officer will look outside at the queue and say, oh, it's backed up to the duty-free sign, so the wait time must be 30 minutes. That's not good data. <laughs> Without consistent and comparable data, however, it's going to be very difficult to assess not only how the border is performing, but how we can best respond to that performance through appropriate innovations and advancing different technologies. So that's all I have. Thank you. Great. <coughs> Terrific. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Laurie, for sharing those uh, important insights from uh, the work of your institute. So we have a few minutes for uh, questions. There's probably a, a microphone uh, roving in the room, but uh, maybe while, uh, while you gather your thoughts for, uh, for questions, uh, I'll put one to the, uh, to the panel. Um, you know, we heard, Tony, you, s you observed at the beginning that the Canada-U.S. border is a, is a model for much of the world. And I think, you know, there's certainly a lot to be, to be proud of in, in, in terms of the, the excellent cooperation and, and the progress that we've made. But I think, you know, governments on both sides uh, obviously want to, want to continue to make it better. We're going to hear from uh, government uh, experts uh, later in the day. But I'm wondering if, if, if you could, uh, some of you sh uh, share just some very quick thoughts on, on what else 
we could do uh, to optimize the, the cooperation between governments and stakeholders. I think, you know, Laura, you, you, you flagged it at the, at the end of your, uh, your, your contribution, and, and I think we heard a few references here and there, but is there anything our panelists would like to add on, on how to be even more successful in terms of the cooperation between governments and transportation stakeholders to, to further optimize the border? Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, Martin, I, we have a tremendous um, economic relationship between our two countries. Uh, I believe that the more the governments cooperate, the, uh, the more you can streamline the process, and not only just for economic um, well-being for both countries, but there are ways of streamlining it where it becomes seamless. It, it, some people would argue, why do we have a border to begin with? Well, we do because we're two separate countries. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to make it more seamless. I mean, I can only speak on behalf of the airport side of it, but the airports bring in tremendous amounts of uh, uh, economic uh, reality to both sides of the border. I think that if we are willing to participate in problem solving, and it's not done yet, uh, there are where what I would say we're talking like this right now. We used to be talking like this. When we talk like this, we're we're getting closer to having a situation where both border, both sides of the border, are happy with not only the economic impact we're having on each other, but also on the safety and security that we're providing for our respective citizens. And, and it, that requires um, our authorities on both sides of the border to have honest discussions about what we can or can't do. And that has to continue. It's far better than we have in other countries, but um, this can be better. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks, Kevin. Any other thoughts on that before we go to the floor? T Tony and then, uh, and then Jennifer. Well, I mean, it, it, it's all about collaboration. And I don't know how many of you remember the IATA SPT program that we set up uh, back in the early 2000s, which brought together um, the, um, the international organizations, the uh, airports, the, the airlines, the control agencies from around the world and the technology providers in a, in a forum, uh, a bit like this, but, but one that lasted, one was durable, that we came back again. <laughs> what I find is I go to a lot of events like this around the world and we all go away and we come up with some fantastic ideas and then we all disappear back into our day, day jobs and there, there isn't really enough momentum, or, and I don't know whether it's funding or, or what it is, but, but there is so much to be learnt, I think, across international practice. You know, I could spend hours telling you what's happening in Singapore, what's happening in Australia, which might interest you might not you know the trucker stories you know you, you guys are actually held up pretty good at truckers so god help us in in dover um you know if when we leave you so i mean i just think that there, there needs to be a concerted effort from all of us to build a platform of of communication across the transportation companies and 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 government internationally because without that i i'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm quite pessimistic i'm afraid Thank you. Well, I, I think I did hear Jerry say that he wants to keep this conversation going, so I don't think this is a, this is necessarily a one-off. Uh, Tony, but Jennifer? Yeah, um, I was just going to say, you know, sometimes it's, it's frustrating because I, I worked for a trucking company for a time, too, and when we would have some conversations with government, particularly the Canadian government, we would hear, well, you know, we have to be different because we're a sovereign nation, and that would be really frustrating because as a trucking company, it, it, a truck that crosses the border into the United States invariably is going to turn around and come back to Canada, we hope, right? And CBP hopes too. And generally that does happen. So harmony has to be the goal. Uh, and, and, you know, I know, at least in talking to CBSA, you know, they don't like that word, uh, you know, harmonize, harmonize. Uh, you know, we have to be a little bit different. No, no, not, not when it comes to the land border. We really can't be. We have to be as much the same as possible. That's how you're going to create the most efficiencies. A and on that note, I, you know, I know I, I, I talked already about BTB um, creating an environment where CBP and CBSA are talking like never before. That's great. Um, but we also have to see it at, at the, what we in Canada call the OGD level, the other government department level, or the PGA level if you're here in the States. Um, you know, when we look at some of the pilots under the Beyond the Border, um, they, some of them, uh, you know, they came up against barriers because the other government departments involved in the movement of freight weren't talking to each other, don't recognize the work of each other. And as we're moving towards discussions about single window and North American single window, if those other government departments that are in involved in the movement and the import and the export of the freight aren't not just talking about similar data requirements, but accepting each other's inspections, the goods are still going to stop at the border. 
So that is an imperative and fundamental piece that has to be brought into these discussions. And then the last two points I'll make is to leverage public-private partnerships. Um, industry wants to put money towards things that are going to make the border better. So use us. That's what we're here for. Um, and pilots, the Beyond the Border Action Plan, allowed for the pilots to happen, um, although some, some of them maybe shouldn't have gone on as long as they did. If they're not working, let's stop them. Let's not stick with them just because we said we would. Um, but pilots are, are really also key because it gives us an opportunity to test the water. Well, this sounds like a good idea. Does it make sense? Let's pilot it. Let's find some industry partners that will put money behind it. Let's, mm -hmm. let's see if it works, and then we'll go from there. So. Okay, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So if you've got a question, uh, please uh, raise your hand and uh, someone will come around with a mic. So we'll, we'll take two, uh, two quick ones uh, now. Good morning and thank you for the insight. My name is Jeff Usher and I'm with the Association of American Railroads and I'd like to offer the railroad experience in what we are seeing and the cooperation that we have both on the northern border and the southern border with CBSA and CBP, CBP and with Adonis. Um, we have experienced incredible cooperation and we do that when we bring them into, we have a transborder committee that we, that we sponsor that includes the seven class one railroads, CNCP coming in from Canada, both operating north and south of the, the US border, mm -hmm. uh, Kansas City Southern and FXE uh, working up towards the Mexican border. I understand that we're, we're looking at the Canadian side. Um, we have worked very, very closely with not only uh, CBP, CPSA, the USDA, uh, as you mentioned, the, the various uh, alphabet soup of folks that are out there. Uh, and, and part of our success is to, is to work very diligently to have them come into our meetings to participate with us. Uh, we have been able to run a number of pilots uh, on the rail side, now recognizing that there is a finite side, uh, a finite number of crossings. Uh, but we have, I think, achieved some of the, the uh, cooperation that you're asking for, and we'd be happy to uh, share with anyone that, that's interested in that. Great. No, thank you. Thank you for uh, for sharing a, a different mode. So one, one more uh, towards the back, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Isabel Hill, and I am the director of the National Travel and Tourism Office for the United States over at the Department of Commerce. Um, I want to thank the Wilson Center for uh, convening this conversation, which I think is, is, is really important, not just between the U.S. and Canada, but as we enter into a global conversation about the movement of goods and people. And before Tony Smith leaves, um, you, have, you have made a, a, a reference to, and I know have been part of an ongoing conversation, about uh, the process of identity management. Um, and as we talk about harmonization of standards, I, w I, w I was wondering if you could talk to us about where you see the beginning of this in identity management in terms of harmonization of requirements across governments. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sorry, Jen, thank you. I, I see our timekeeper is, uh, is waving, so we'll, if we could please uh, try to do that in 30 seconds and then maybe continue <laughs> offline because it is an important <laughs> issue, but thank you. 30-second <laughs> answer. I mean, I'm talking about this downstairs at another event this afternoon. So, uh, But essentially, we need to lock down an identity and agree what it is, and we all need to do that. And when we've locked that identity down uh, globally, we can start to use it. I am, I am very impressed with blockchain, actually. I'm not a techie, but I like the sound of blockchain. I like the World Eco Economic Forum work that's going on in Canada right now. Follow that with blockchain and, and global ID, because if we can get global ID locked down and we can all accept global ID, we can do a heck of a lot on Seamless. 30 seconds up, I think. <laughs> Super. All right. Th thank you very much, Tony. Uh, well done. And uh, I I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists, Tony, Kevin, Jennifer, Laurie. Tremendous insights. Thank you very much. Thank you.